Right, let's do a book review, shall we? I'm going to look at my favourite Russian novel, Oblomov by Ivan Goncharov, which I have here in translation by David Magrashak. This is a book I read at university. In first year, no less, I was at St Andrews University in Scotland, where I studied Russian language and literature from 1993 to 98. And I read this in first year when I was pretty new to the idea of essay writing and completely new to literature. I'd never read any classic literature. And so, well, it depends how you define classic literature, doesn't it? And I'd read the Chronicles of Narnia, for instance. Uh, lots of fantasy. I uh, can't think if there's any other books I'd read I would have classed as literature. But in first year, my my essay writing was terrible. It was still not great today, if I'm honest. But back then, the first novel I read, or it was a short story, was a Chekhov story. And I hand wrote my essay for that and struggled quite hard with it. And for some reason in my mind, I remember reading this later at my St Andrews University student days, but I didn't because I've looked it up and it's been confirmed that I read it in first year. So probably 94. And I got a good mark for my essay. And that's something that was never really repeated through the whole time I was at St Andrews. I always got a 2-1, sometimes a 2-2 two -two if I did really poorly. Generally a 2-1, which is an upper second class mark. But for this one, I got a first. I got 74 out of 80. My professor was impressed with my essay. And the essay title was, What is Oblomovism and Can It Be Cured? So we'll get to my conclusion later. Why did I relate to this? Well, first of all, let me show you. The, this is the Russian which I bought when I was in Ukraine. Is it, oh, it's got Odessa, 6th of March, 96, written in the front in Biro. So that's when I bought this, 96. Why did I get a good mark? What is it about this novel that I found relatable? Well, I read it again last year. And I read my essay, and I also bought this book, which is the one that I cited in the footnotes of my essay as being the secondary reading that I used for my essay. This is by Milton Eyre, Oblomov and his creator, The Life and Art of Ivan Goncharov. So I read that as well because I was just blown away by how relatable this book was to me. Now, in the, the years since then and now, I've had a lot going on in my life, as we all have. But large a large part of that is to do with, well, first of all, through alcoholism into recovery, which then led me into looking at some mental health issues that may or may not be in my life. I haven't had any diagnoses, but I am sure that there is some autism there, with some ADHD, or certainly ADD, I read a good book about that last year and I'm convinced that those are in my life and they're also in my family. So without going into too much detail about that, I'll just put it out there. And as I read it, towards the end of last year, I read it with a pencil. I've started annotating books. You believe that? And the thing that struck me the most was that this character, Oblomov, seems to suffer from some of the same problems that I've experienced in my own life, mental health, however you want to put it. And I think that's why I related to it so well when I was 21. Yeah, I would have been 21 when I read it. I'm now 52, so there's an idea of how many years have passed. And the character of Oblomov is indolent, lazy. He's born of the nobility. 
He's born of the serf owning class. Now, this was published in 1859 before the serfs were freed by Tsar Alexander II in 1861. And it started out as being published in 1849 when a section of the book called Oblomov's Dream was published. And I think books tended then to be published in periodicals rather than as single volumes. They were published in part. And this book, or this section, Oblomov's Dream, was published in a periodical. And it's a section in the book that takes you out of the main plot and takes you back in time to Oblomov's childhood as he's trying to escape from the, I suppose what you might call helicopter parenting now. Interesting, that's just come to me. So there's a scene where he tries to run off into the woods or to play in the snow. So he's a toddler, basically, and he wants to go and play in the snow because what toddler wouldn't want to do that? And his family freaks out and they go and find him and bring him home and he gets cosseted and wrapped up and told not to go out in the snow again. It's like a scene where he's... They're playing out the the roles of the nobility, the noble classes, as they have these philosophical discussions. And it's basically setting the scene for what life was like for the nobility back in those days in Russia. So why the serfdom? Why would that have any bearing on the publishing? Well, there's a, a bit here in the introduction which I'll, I'll talk about. Goncharov was critical of serfdom in this book. And he was afraid of censorship. Tsar Nicholas I was quite strict with the censorship laws. And so Goncharov... I'm sure, decided to play it safe and not publish. But the Tsar died in 1955 and he was superseded by Alexander II who was responsible for the emancipation of the serfs in 1861. So I think at that time Goncharov felt more able to publish his novel which was anti-establishment. So Goncharov himself was not nobility, he was bourgeoisie, middle class, however you want to describe that. In political terms it says here that he was bourgeois and it said that in his first book, uh, An Ordinary Story, it de deals with the conflict between the decaying class of the Russian landed aristocracy and the newly emerging class of the Russian bourgeoisie, whose defence Goncharov, naturally enough, took up. So that's interesting. So when his Oblomov's Dream was published in 1849, that particular portion of the book doesn't deal with serfdom at all. So I think he was quite safe with that. And then Goncharov, interestingly enough, went on to become a censor. Yeah, he was appointed as a literary censor in 1856. So that would have been under Tsar Alexander II. Interesting, huh? So, I mean, that kind of sets the scene. Now, the title of my essay was What is Oblomovism? And in this translation, I think it refers to it as Oblomovitis. In Russian, it's Oblomovshina. And that's the condition that describes the indolence of the main character, Oblomov. He wants to break free from his indolence, but he just seems to be unable to. And whether that's to do with mental health or, or what, or conditioning possibly, because of the way he was brought up, not to be able to go out and have fun break family ties, he had he had to be indoors, he had to be safe. So, as we meet him, he's lying on his sofa, he lies about the house, he's got a serf, or a servant, a servant's probably the better word, called Zachar, and he's, he's a character. He brings a lot of humour into it. In fact, the relationship between them is, is quite humorous. 
at times. There's a lot of shouting goes on. And uh, people come round to visit Oblomov and they try and persuade him to go here and go there. And he cries, I can't, I can't. You know, I wish I could, but I can't. And he lies on his couch. He's wears this Persian uh, gown, dressing gown. And he just lies about all day long. He's got books sitting around him that are in different states of having been read, dog-eared, left open on the desk, like that, with dust on top of them. There's plates around them with leftover food that's been sitting there who knows how long. It strikes me as the kind of house of someone with attention deficit disorder, or attention deficit and hyperactivity disorder. And having studied that, quite recently you know that's that's what came into my mind right, here's a wee bit from the introduction written by David Magershack which explains quite well what's happening here in his reminiscences Goncharov pointed out that he created the character of Oblomov as a result both of his personal observations and self-analysis already as a very observant and impressionable little boy he wrote he was so deeply struck by the carefree existence and the idleness of the representatives of the nobility in his native town that a vague impression of Oblomov as a type of human being first arose in his mind. Later on he declared, Oblomov's indolent image was constantly thrust before my eyes and myself and others. In creating Oblomov, therefore, Goncharov had in mind the universal aspect of his hero, and indeed, the greatness of his novel as a work of art lies in the universality of its hero. Oblomov can hardly be said to be a typically Russian character. There are thousands of Oblomovs scattered all over the world. And I would list myself as one such person. <laughs> right, here's a wee section that talks about depression, which I've marked as work to live, live to work, purpose, exclamation mark. Why keep working? So he says, in that case, when are you going to live? Oblomov replied, vexed by Stoltz's remarks. Why work hard all your life? Stoltz replies, for the sake of the work itself and nothing else. Work means everything to me. It is the very breath of life, of my life at any rate. You have banished work from your life, and what is it like? I'll try to raise you up, perhaps for the last time. If after this you still go on sitting here with the Tarantievs and the Alexeyevs, you will be done for and become a burden even to yourself. Now or never, he concludes. And this comes up again and again. Oblomov remembers this in his mind. Now or never. And when the chance of a relationship comes up when he falls in love with Olga. This comes back into his mind, this idea of now or never. And here's the depression section where I've written that he's identifying with other people's ambitions and seeing no meaning in them. Stoltz could have guided him, but he left. And then I've written depression here next to this paragraph. You said just now that my face had lost its freshness and was flabby, Oblomov continued. Yes, I am an old shabby worn-out coat, but not because of the climate or hard work, but because for twelve years the light has been shut up within me and unable to find an outlet. It merely consumed itself inside its prison house and was extinguished without breaking out into the open. And so twelve years have passed, my dear Andre, and I did not want to wake up any more. It's kind of heartbreaking, isn't it? It hits me hard, that paragraph. He's an old shabby worn out coat. So we have the imagery of his dressing gown that he dresses in. The worn out Persian patched up dressing gown that's shabby and worn out. And for 12 years, the light's been shut up inside him. It makes me think of the Oblomov's dream section when he's shut up in the childhood home in Oblomovka and he's not able to 
express himself, to get out, to to live, you know. And so this life, this light, has been shut up inside him for 12 years. And what happens to the light? It disappears, it goes out. So it consumes itself inside its prison house and was extinguished without breaking out into the open. I mean, <sighs> wow. Here's another wee section that describes the, his attempts to rise above his oblomovitis. So I've written on the side here, is oblomovism depression? Is this the remedy, now or never? So he's remembering that. Fetch me some paper and ink, replied Oblomov. He was pondering over the words, now or never. As he listened intently to this desperate appeal of reason and energy, he realised and carefully weighed up the amount of willpower he still had left and where he could apply and what use he could make of that meagre remnant. After thinking it over painfully, he seized the pen and pulled a book out of the corner, wishing to read, write and think over in one hour what he had not read, written and thought over in ten years. What was he to do now? Go forward or stay where he was? This typically oblomov question was of deeper significance to him than Hamlet's. I presume that's the to be or not to be question. To go forward meant to throw the capacious dressing gown not only off his shoulders, but also from his heart and mind. To sweep the dust and cobwebs from his eyes as well as from the walls and to recover his sight. What was the first step towards it? What had he to start with? I don't know. I can't. No. I'm trying to deceive myself. I do know. And besides, Stoltz is here and he will tell me at once. But what would he say? He would say that during the week I should write detailed instructions to my agent or send him to the country, mortgage Oblomovka, buy some more land, send down a plan of the buildings to be erected, give up my flat, take out a passport and go abroad for six months, get rid of my superfluous fat, throw off my heaviness, refresh my soul with the air of which I once dreamed with my friend, live without a dressing gown, without Zachar and Tarantiev, Put on my socks and take off my boots myself. Sleep at night only. Travel where everyone else is travelling, by rail or steamer. Then, then, go to live in Oblomovka. Learn what sowing and harvesting means. Why a peasant is rich or poor. Go out into the fields. Journey to the district town for the elections. Visit the factory, the mill, the landing stage. And at the same time, read the newspapers, books, and worry about why the English have sent a man of war to the Far East. That's what he would say. That is what going forward means. And so, all my life, goodbye, poetic ideal of life. When is one to live? Had one better not stay? <laughs> it's so relatable when I think of all the things I have to do each day, you know. And all I want to do is read books. I want to sit at home, put my scarf on, Make myself a cup of coffee, pick up a book, and just sit on the sofa. That's my dream life. So, Oblomov, yeah, I'm kind of with you. But meaning and purpose, my friends. Meaning and purpose. And speaking of meaning and purpose, here's a section which I've marked as purposelessness. That's a good word, isn't it? So it says, find something to do. I could do that if I had some aim in life. But what is my aim? I haven't one. The aim is to live. When you don't know what to live for, you live anyhow, from one day to another. You are glad the day is over, that the night has come, and in your sleep you can expunge from your mind the wearisome question why you have lived this day and are going to live the next. She listened in silence with a stern look. Severity was hidden in her knit brows, and incredulity or scorn coiled like a serpent in the line of her lips. Why, you have lived, she repeated. Why, can anyone's life be useless? It can. Mine, for instance, he said. There's a lot about purposelessness in this book. And when he meets Olga, 
And when he falls in love with Olga, his life becomes filled with meaning. And that's when he gets his dressing gown off, gets himself dressed, gets out the house, starts to follow some of Stoltz's advice and becomes a man with purpose. And it's love that gives him that. But there's a part of him that doesn't believe he deserves it. And there's scenes in the book where he he starts sabotaging the love that he has with Olga. Until eventually he writes her a letter and he tells her that she should go and find someone else because he's not worthy of her love. She deserves better. And she doesn't take it well. She's very upset by it as... I'm saying it's understandable. Because she does love him. It's made quite plain in the way the book is written. She loves him dearly. But he believes that he's unworthy, so he sabotages it. And that causes a change in the plot. I don't know how much more to go into because there's a lot in the plot that I shouldn't really spoil, so I won't do that. I won't go through the whole story and let you know how it turns out. You can read the book yourself for that. What surprised me, though, is that a book written in what, between 1849 and 1859 is so full of relatable human conditions that are present for me today. Perhaps that shouldn't surprise me, because I don't think the human condition really has changed in centuries, probably. But this, for me, is part of my life. This is why I make YouTube videos. This is why I journal every day and why I started going swimming every morning, why I'm using the creative act, making videos, writing. This is all to add, or to help me to discover meaning and purpose, to discover the, the areas of my life where I'm failing and to fix them, to understand why I'm failing and then to fix them. So relationships, love, family, these are the upper echelons of purpose. I mean, this is no surprise to you, I'm sure. Love and family, these are the reasons for life, aren't they, really? If it comes down to it and you're lying in your deathbed, you're never going to say, well, I wish I'd watched more Netflix, you know? I wish I'd worked more. You're going to say, I wish I'd spent more time with my family, my loved ones. And so for Oblomov, when love comes along, lifts him out of his purposelessness and gives him meaning. It's really quite powerful. But in the end, well, in the end, you can read the book for that. So I think that's why I related so well to this book, even at the age of 21, when I didn't know any of this. I didn't understand any of it. I wouldn't describe myself as lazy. I'm not a shirker. I do have a work ethic. I can complete tasks when I set my mind to it. I'm a good husband, a good father. And those are values that I aspire to every day. And when I fail at them, they come up because I journal about it. It's part of my recovery through 12 steps of AA. I'm sure that won't be the last time I mentioned that on the channel. Through taking personal inventory which is part of the 12 steps. And when I'm wrong, promptly admitting it. But it's, it's amazing how much one can get from reading literature, fiction, other people's art and creation. I've talked about this in my review of Assassin's Apprentice, which is a completely different genre to this, but relatable because that book is about meaning and purpose and creation and connection, human connection. And so is this book. And I think ultimately, the creative act, art in general, is a way for us all to, to connect.
connect to one another. If I'm able to express myself fearlessly, fearlessly and to discuss difficult topics, it helps me to understand myself and to get well and to stay well. And I think it serves as an example of how one can be vulnerable and at the same time show strength. Strength through vulnerability. And I think when people create characters like this, you know, it did say in the introduction when I read it out that, let me just go back to it as a reminder. He says, Oblomov's indolent image was constantly thrust before my eyes in myself and others. So Goncharov is, is using the character to express his own flaws the things in himself that he wishes were otherwise, the things he would like to change. And whether Oblomov is successful in that, you'll have to read the book to discover. But art as a creative tool, as a way of expressing oneself, as a tool of discovery, it's a very, very powerful thing. And it's universal. It does say that also in the introduction, that the character of Oblomov is universal. It's not specific to Russia. It's not specific to the 19th century. It's universal and it will always be thus. And that's why having this outlet, this connection with you as a viewer, you're connecting with me as a creator and I'm creating something that's going into your mind and helping you in ways that you might not have realized. And hopefully that can be passed on and you can then take on board some of this. You can go and read the book. You might read the book and understand it better. You might read a different book and get things out of it that you might not have. And that gets passed on and we all we all grow. We all connect. It's a beautiful, beautiful thing. So I know this has been very rambly. I guess that's just how my videos are going to be. Rambly, incoherent, but hopefully helpful. So... If this has helped you, let me know. I'd love to hear from you. If you read the book, which I urge you to do, enjoy it. Speak to you again soon. Bye. forgot to say, if, if you'd like to read my essay, I'll put a link to it down in the description so you can download it and have a wee read. My first year Oblomov essay. What is Oblomovism? And can it be cured?